Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for another episode of Cranked and, and Ranked. ranked. <laughs> and that, that felt that felt better uh, instead of just me being like, "Hey, people, I should I should do something like that. I could do a different voice." Um, You're gonna put like yes. a massive announcer delay and reverb on it as well. Yeah, yeah. That's our, that's or, our new intro now. Or I'll just do <laughs> I'll just do it like you know in the old school where I I just repeat the word over and over again to make it sound. Like I'm in a big hall. Like ladies, 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 and and and, and <laughs> gentlemen, 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 and, and that's way too much work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us for this episode of Cranked and Ranked. Uh, uh, I'm Old Head or Steven. With me, as always, Mr. Eddie Sparks. Say hello, sir. Sup? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for joining. Uh, once again, as usual, we're ranking uh, something rock and metal and or, or both, related. Uh, today, it is not a band discography. We just got off of doing a three-parter of KISS, which was uh, quite an undertaking, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. But um, we, we decided to go with ranking our top five favorites from another year, and it just so happens that this just, it, it dovetails, or whatever the, the word <laughs> I'm looking for is, nicely into you know from kiss into this one we're going to be talking about our top five favorite albums from the year 1976 when not only was eddie not alive i was also not alive i was born in 78 so i uh, heard all these albums much later so this is interesting this is the first year we've done where we are both not born when this in music the, is uh in the same boat generationally <laughs> yep and so, um, as usual, I like to say this often whenever we do these year ones, but um, in no means is this considered to be the top five best albums of this year. Th- these are just our top five favorite albums of the year. Instead of going with the kind of ranking we do with discographies where we're trying to give kind of an overview of not only how we feel, but just take other things into account when we rank their albums. When it comes to these year ones, I just go with my gut. How do I feel? Which ones do I enjoy the most? Which ones have lasted the longest? And it's just, it's just a personal thing. So this, it's just fun. So all, all of you can join in at home. Um, so um, I don't really have any, I mean, I, you can't say anything about 1976 because, you know, we, uh, we weren't alive. Um, I have although, one thing. Okay, go for that. It's the year my mother was born. Oh, wow. Your mom is only two years older than me. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, Also, 1976 is the year uh, that the movie Dazed and Confused takes place, uh, which it also takes place in my hometown of Austin, Texas, and was filmed in my hometown of Austin, Texas. Um, So that's, that's a fun tidbit. Yeah, that's um, really cool. Yeah, and a great movie. That's a movie that never gets old to me. It's just uh, one, of, one of the best sort of like teen romps, I think, that's ever been made. Anyway, so, but let's just, let's go ahead and jump right in. I, I don't think we need much more of an introduction. It's 1976. Um, it's a weird time because rock and roll is still pretty big, but also this is disco times. Um, and a yeah. lot of bands, there were a lot of those like funk, the funk bands were pretty big around that time too. Um, and I think, think i mean i mean i mean i guess when it comes to popular music it was kind of all over the place like i don't think there was a dominating form of music yet because i think disco was yeah. getting big i feel like it got bigger around 77 i might be wrong um but it anyway. seems like a, a second half of the 70s movement yeah Dis- yeah disco definitely was so um it's an interesting year to look at but um you know especially for me since i am a big fan of rock and metal. Um, I didn't veer too far out of that. Actually, I didn't veer at all out of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so without further ado, as we usually started off, I let Eddie take the lead, and uh, we're doing our talk, talk, our talk fives or whatever <laughs> words and things. 
uh, top five. So, Eddie, start us off with your number five album from 1976. So, my number five pick is the only one that I really had to think about because the the four above it, I knew were going to make the list. But my number five danced around a lot with a lot of other albums because I thought, oh, I like that one too. But in the end... I took one look, one last look at the album cover, and I decided this has to, this has to be my five at least. So I've gone for Rainbows Rising. Okay, all right, a Rainbow album, gotcha. Yeah, it's it's a relatively recent discovery in Eddie's world because, like, I, I don't know what it is about. Richie Blackmore's lead guitar tone that took me a long time to warm up to a little bit because it uh-huh. is it's pretty twangy but like I prefer like the smoother kind of tones whenever you're shredding stuff out but yeah Richie Blackmore I, who was previously in the band Deep Purple uh, yeah. prior to starting Rainbow um, but yeah he was a great guitar player oh for sure definitely hugely influential and you know I love the riffs especially on this album and how everything ties together and it feels so epic yet still is pretty dry in 70s at the same time mm-hmm. like it it definitely feels like something that could be played in a room but also translates excellently to an arena mm-hmm. so like this this album, let me let me get the track list so up, before, man. So before we start this, I don't know a lot about Rainbow. Is this an album that has Ronnie James Dio on vocals? This is a Dio album, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and it's fucking rad, dude. Um, Taro Woman, so cool. Like, this really cool 70s synth intro, and then just goes into this, like, power metal before power metal was a thing kind yeah. of vibe. You know, even looking at the artwork, like, it's a giant fucking fist in the sky with its you know fingers gripped around a, a rainbow yeah. have obviously. they ever I'm, I'm sure i'm sure somebody has said it but w- wouldn't you consider ronnie james dio like the godfather of power metal like i feel One, like 100 <laughs> percent. yeah i feel like all of those groups they all are fans of dio as well as anyone really that that just likes incredible singing you know yeah it's it, it's funny as well because he like I know Led Zeppelin did some of it too, but he really brought like the Dungeons and Dragons vibe into into yeah. metal. He was a leading force. I think in the difference that. between the two is that Led Zeppelin seemed like dudes that they read a book and then wrote a song. Ronnie James Dio seemed like he lived and breathed that subject matter. Like he loved it. Yeah. And so makes it a lot more genuine. Something I've always loved about Dio is his ability to always mention rainbows in his lyrics as well as be in a band called Rainbow and make it sound like the fucking coolest thing in the world. Like, generally speaking, you think, you know, oh, a rainbow, that's pretty. And then, you know, Dio will say something and you'll think, oh, that's fucking epic, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a certain vibe to how he delivers things that's so... It, it, it feels he feels like this like wise old sage that's like walked the fucking realms and yeah, I, I I I was in awe of this when I sat down and gave it a proper listen because yeah song after song on this is is awesome run with the wolf killer groove I know I'm kind of doing a track by track here which oh, that's is all right some, do do what you feel babes yeah <laughs> <laughs> Ah, babes. Um, (laughs) uh, So, yeah. Starstruck. Such a catchy song. Do you close your eyes? Stargazer steals the show here. Like, what a song. It... Stargazer is what fucking Kashmir would sound like if Black Sabbath made it. Yeah. Like, it's like that perfect mix of groove and epic... And I love the fact that the the first four tracks, I th- I've got the vinyl on hand somewhere here, but I've, I think this is one of those like 70s albums where the last side is just two tracks, but they're relatively lengthy. Like yeah. the two last songs on here, Stargazer and A Light in the Black, are both approaching the eight and a half minute mark, at least. Mm-hmm. Um 
and they, they just fucking rule. And it, it's that perfect mixture of, of vibe and genuinely good song. Like, yeah. It's interesting riffs. too how it's interesting how m- music made in the seventies. Like, if I see an album from the seventies and I see a track that is eight to ten minutes or longer, I feel confident that it's going to be pretty enjoyable. If yeah. you flash forward to anything more recent, if I see that, I go, "Fuck no, I don't have the time for this." Yeah, because <laughs> it seems like it just doesn't ever pay off. Where I think in the that there was a lot of bands doing that in the seventies, and I feel like there was people were just a lot more ambitious. And so it was a lot more interesting to listen to these massive songs, you know? Yeah. Also like this was at a time when vinyl was still like the King format. Like it, I suppose cassettes were coming up in the seventies and, you know, they would have their real heyday in the eighties. But um, I think usually you would see on albums, you would buy the vinyl and it would say also available on cassette and eight track. Like yeah. that would be, that would be the other, the other mediums. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool how these older bands from like the seventies and stuff will have long tracks. And you know that this was from a time where you couldn't just skip it, you know? So they knew they had their listeners attention they didn't mm-hmm. really have they didn't really have a choice so you kind of appreciated it more you paid more attention to to really pick out things that you would like and overall you know it, this is one of those albums where i'm like where has this been you know, it, <laughs> yeah it, it it's so fucking cool and it's a relatively short album though it's only got 6 songs it's 33 minutes long um That's, that sounds great yeah <laughs> And the last, the last two songs make up, the last two songs make up half the album. <laughs> but yeah. um, that's I mean, really cool. I, I have to admit, I, I I don't know a lot about Rainbow, and I and I on, honestly, even my knowledge about Deep Purple is pretty limited. I only know a handful of their albums really well, and so Rainbow is one of those bands that I, I know eventually I'm going to get to it and I'm going to love it, but um, I haven't really dove into it yet and i feel is this the first rainbow album the this one right here i think it's i think it's the second i think it's the second rainbow album but um you know i i like i say it's a pretty relatively recent discovery for me as well um i would recommend starting here because this blew me away um yeah i know because they've had quite a few vocalists as well i think they've had uh graham bonnet and joe lynn turner as well which mm-hmm. are all great vocalists in in this style. But, oh my god, man! Rising is so. I recommend this highly. <laughs> it's it's interesting that that seems to be a uh, o- overall throughout Richie Blackmore's career. That seems to be a, a a theme where he is constantly working with different musicians in the same band. Like there was how many versions of Deep Purple? With oh yeah. How, how many different vocalists and. I don't know if that says anything about Richie Blackmore being difficult to work with. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but it, it's it's def- it's definitely interesting. Mm. But uh, that's a, that's a great that's a great start. So that, so I, I love when we do these because occasionally there are these albums that um, I don't really know very well, and then I'm all like, oh shit, I'm gonna go check this out now. Yeah, it's to- it's totally worth the 33 minutes because none of it is wasted. Awesome. Cool. So, so for my number five, I'm going to be really, really quick with this one because we literally just talked about this album last <laughs> episode, and so I'm going to get it out of the way really quick. We're not going to do a whole, a whole other Kiss uh, <laughs> episode. Uh, my number five is Destroyer from yeah. Kiss, um, which is, uh, I think it was my number three Kiss album in my ranking. And uh, it was Eddie's number one Kiss album. And it's great. Like, just to quickly talk about it, like, it, when it comes to Kiss, n- once we went and listened to all their albums and then I listened to Destroyer, there's something about it that feels like that's what Kiss should have been doing. Like, I know yeah. that they did, a, they did a more stripped down thing. And then after Destroyer, they went back to try and do a more straightforward rock sound. And, and I like that stuff, too. But for some reason, the the 
is it the bombacity or whatever of yeah. of Destroyer seems to fit the band way more than any other album they ever did. And um, even going back to listen to it again for this episode, I was just like, I'm going to go, you know, go through the songs real quick and just, you know, because I have to figure out where I'm going to place it. And, you know, after going through it, I was like, well, it's definitely in the top five because it's just got like there's there, there's no bad song on it. We talked about Great Expectations being a little bit on the on the fence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think I've decided that I actually do like that song. Creepy or not, I think the creepy vibe adds something to it. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> and it's, it's another one of those uh, ambitious moments on the album, and that's why I love it. It's an ambitious album from a band that overall was pretty ambitious. It just seems musically they usually were a little more straightforward. So yeah. I, think, I think it's the ultimate Kiss album. And um, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I, I totally get you putting it at number one. Yeah. And so yeah, I don't I don't have much more to add. Uh go back and listen to our Kiss discography ranking if you want to hear us really talk about Kiss albums, but um I couldn't leave it out cuz it's such a it's such an amazing record. So my number 5 is Destroyer. Awesome. Um so my number 4, you're going to like this one. Uh okay. my number 4, and I'm pretty sure that this is in yours as well cuz if it isn't, okay. I'm going to be shocked. <laughs> okay. I I have gone for 2112 by Rush. That that is quite an amazing album, sir. It's a good it's a good one to put in here. I'm not gonna Hell I'm yeah. not gonna give anything away. I may it may be in my top five. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the Rush albums I've heard, and I love all the Rush albums I've heard. I've heard like three properly, but I, I want which, to, which three have you heard? Uh, this one, Permanent Waves, and Moving Pictures. I need to hear a bunch of others you, as well you do ne- next step for you should be hemispheres i would say uh, yeah it's, uh, it's, but there's but yes all, all great albums one day we're gonna do the kiss uh, kiss motherfucker <laughs> we're rush. gonna do kiss again <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't get enough the first time um eventually we'll do the rush discography and i will uh enjoy every minute of, a minute of it but right now we get to talk about 2112 let's do it totally so here is here is a fun little fact here is a story of my first exposure to 2112 all right so the back in about 2010 a little video game came out called guitar hero warriors of rock okay and it was the last installment in the original run of guitar hero games Mm -hmm. and i remember the entire 2112 suite is on the game split up into levels where it kind of tells the story of the song visually. And each time you complete like a, a section, it would fade to another area. And you like it's be... the, it, the entire 18 minute song. It goes through all of that. Yeah. The, the entire 20, tw- the entire 20 minute thing, but like split awesome. into, they would split each song into its own like little level. And you would be playing, in like a different Rush twenty one twelve inspired air, like wow. area. Where yeah. where is it? where I don't I want to play this game. I want to find yeah. a version of that so I can play it. That sounds awesome. Like it, obviously in, in in the game you would have like a separate career mode, but amazingly they decided, hey, let's just make twenty one twelve its own little mini story mode because it's just so fucking epic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a really cool thing because this was my first. Um exposure to you know 2112 and i was blown away by it because you know it has my favorite chord sequence in it (laughs) (laughs) so fucking good oh man temples of syrinx there's so many there's so many great excellent moments in this song alone like they could have put that single like song out, split it up into the individual tracks, called it an album, and that would have been just as iconic as yeah. the as the rest of the album as well. Because doesn't it take up all of like side A and then yeah yeah, yeah. twenty one twelve is side A and then the second side are uh, individual tracks. Yeah, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah. A passage to Bangkok, oh, so good. The the riff, down 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 down. So, down, so down, yeah, down. 
I, so, uh, I, okay, okay, it, this is in my list, so I'm not going to say everything I'm going to say. <laughs> but that particular song, the reason why I love it so much is because the guitar starts off by itself playing the lower riff. And then when the bass kicks in with that, the guitar goes to a higher one and does that. And the way they go together, I'm just like, that's so fucking cool. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that, that's one of my favorite probably in my top 10 of like rush riffs just because of that that change um for when they yeah. come together I'm like that sounds so cool it's like it's like a cool duality like when one comes in the other must take on another role yeah 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 those <gasps> dudes those dudes were probably the greatest power trio in the world just because they could yeah. make these songs and you would see them recreate these for the most part completely live and they would you would never, it, you don't even think about it being just three dudes unless you're watching them and going, oh shit, they're doing all this shit and Getty's playing the bass and the keyboards at the same time or, or uh, Alex has like a, has pedals where he's playing like individual like synth notes with his foot. <laughs> just like, yeah. that's just fucking crazy. But man, they were the best. It, had I entered this album not knowing Rush was a trio, I would have thought it was a five or six person band, Yeah, you know? I would expect something on like a massive scale, but no, it's got the same amount of members as fucking Green Day and they're making <laughs> stuff like this, you know? It's insane. Oh, Twilight Zone, Lessons, Tears, Something for Nothing. The rest of the album is is fucking phenomenal too, but... Yeah, agreed. Like, oh man, that opening 20 minutes is definitely... It, it's one of the most iconic moments in prog history. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, and that's I'm, why I'm, hold, I'm holding my tongue <laughs> saying <laughs> things about this album. I was gonna try to be all poker faced about it. But I'm like, God damn it, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I've I've said all all I need to say. This album is is one that you know the later tracks took time to sink in for me, but yeah, they're that's not to say that they're not excellent it's just i haven't spent as much time with rush as a band but when i do listen to them and the albums i've heard fucking hell i i i need to convince myself hey look just spend a fucking week listening to nothing but rush you yeah. know you're not going to regret it so why are you not doing it <laughs> i mean i mean yeah i mean yeah. it's it, it th this album is amazing and it, but it is is not my favorite rush album i don't even think 2112 would be in my top five wow. Rush albums. It it might be number five. I don't know. Uh, but they, they've got so much good shit. And they've got... That's the thing is that once you bust into the 80s Rush, you're going... That's where I think you're yeah. going to find your shit. Because not only do they do the synths really come in, but the their, the, their usage of of uh, hooks and melody in these songs that they're creating, which are a lot more stripped down all of a sudden the, the, all the epicness and progginess that was so interesting. It, it's replaced by this just amazing songwriting that just, it's almost like the two different sides of rush are rush uh, in the seventies makes you think. And then rush in the eighties makes you feel. And, yeah. and that's like, what's so great about it. I know we're talking about 2112, but um, that's the way. That's the way I look at it. And then into the '90s, they became kind of a a more sturdy version, a, a more rocking version of the '80s sound. They never really went back to being super proggy, uh, which I guess some people think is bad. But I don't really care. I think that um, once again, it's a it's the, the story of their of their discography is a is a great one to go through. But Twenty One Twelve is is probably the most important Rush album because. You know, they were you know on the verge of getting dropped by their label and then put out 2112 and it happened to be successful, which I don't even understand how. I don't even know if the band understands how, because yeah. it's not like there was a hit single that went out. It's not like they were all really attractive dudes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess I'll, I guess Alex Lifeson's pretty good looking. But I mean, you know, so it's one of those things that just somehow it was the right place, right time, right group of people heard it played it for other people. They played live a lot. People heard them and, and boom, you know, the, the rush story takes off from there. Yeah. 
I, I need to watch that. Um, what's it called? Beyond, Beyond, Beyond the, the Lighted Light Stage. Stage. Yeah, that's yes, the one. it oh, great documentary. Not only is it a great documentary if you love Rush, it if you don't, it's just really entertaining the way it's put together. Awesome. Anyway, yeah. So I uh, yeah. So anything else to say about twenty one twelve? It's fucking rad. You do yours now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, so my number four. This one at first I thought this wouldn't be in my top five. But I went back and listened to it again. And um, it's, God, it's so fucking good. It is, in my opinion, probably not just my opinion. This is probably a fact at this point. The most overplayed album from the 1970s has to be the most overplayed oh. album. Uh, my number three, uh, sorry, what, what, what are we on now? Number four. My number four is the self-titled album from Boston. Yeah. The very first Boston album. So I, this is an album that I've heard so much throughout my life. I had, I got this on vinyl when I was a kid, like from, you know, I told you, I think on another episode that a lot of people were selling their records cause everyone was buying CDs. And I found the Boston album at like a used bookstore or whatever. And when I was probably like, I don't know, 12 maybe. And I was just like, this is the, to me, it was the most solid rock album I had ever heard, where yeah. it was just end to end, big, amazingly well written, big guitars, big hooks, memorable choruses, just filled to the fucking brim. And so it, it makes sense that it, over here in the US, almost all of the album is regularly played on classic rock radio, like not just yeah. the singles, almost every track you will hear. And even today, so this is how many years later, 76 to 2000, and what are we in now? 2021. <laughs> yeah. Shit, uh, man. So, so that makes... Uh, math. Math. Doing math. 40, doing 40, math. 45? Math, math. Doing math. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the, that was the doing math song. Say 45? <laughs> I, I was thinking, is it 45 years since it came out? That makes sense, because I'm, I'm about to be 43. So yeah, I, I would, let's, let's just go with 45. Wow, but that is a long time for the, for an album to still have this kind of life, and so I get it why people get tired of it because you hear it a lot. But just going in and listening to it again, I was just like, man, every song is good, every song, and I love the way that it sounds and the fact that it was essentially recorded in one dude's home studio. Yeah when he was trying to fool the record company because the record company thought he was making it in a big ass studio, but he was actually doing it in his home and, 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 and that, and home dude played pretty much Tom Schultz is home dude. I don't know why I'm calling him home dude. <laughs> um, but, uh, Tom Schultz, uh, essentially played everything on the album except for drums. Um, and then occasionally there's other things that other people played, but he's, he's the majority of it. And then of course, Brad Delp, amazing vocalist on vocals. And the fact that it's just, they managed to put together this album that was beyond what all these bands in studios with, with millions of dollars, probably not millions at that point, but hundreds of thousands of dollars making music, they weren't able to put anything together that huge. And it just, you know, like the, the fucking album cover looks is, is exactly what the album needs. It's just this big yeah. epic sci-fi looking thing. Like it's, you know, what, whatever you think about rock and roll, be ready to have your mind blown. You're going to be transported to another fucking planet now. And have you um, ever noticed, have you ever noticed that the spaceship is a guitar? Yes. Yeah, because uh, that was a that was another recent discovery. I was like, oh yeah, some someone posted a, a a meme in like a classic rock group or something, and it said something along the lines of, "I was today years old when I found out this Boston spaceship is a fucking guitar." Well, it's just because the, yeah, the the way the guitar because the guitar is essentially upside down, where and the strings it. the strings are on the bottom, and you're looking at the bottom of it. So it's like it's flying away, like the the Boston guitar ship is flying away. You better catch it. Yeah. Um, but just like obviously, you know, more than a feeling is just one of the best classic rock songs. But every song, the first side of this album, more than a feeling, peace of mind, foreplay slash long time, that is just probably one of the most perfect side ones of an album ever. Yeah. And. When it comes to albums like this, I understand why it's overplayed. I understand why 
so many people want to listen to this shit even today because it's just it's got it's got enough rocking to where it's rock and roll. It's loud. The guitars are big, but it's got these big hooks that that I I, I almost feel like I don't remember the first time I heard it, but I almost feel like this is an album that you hear it once and you already know the songs. Yeah, you know, like you would remember these songs immediately. Total earworms. And yeah, and so yeah, it's just. To me, it's just an amazing example of like what people could do in the seventies, because it's just, it's it's uh, it's sure. It, I, mean, I, I guess it, it, depending on what your musical tastes are, this could be looked at as a little bit of a cheese fest. Some of the stuff on here, but it's just so well done, and I don't know. And it's and unfortunately, the band never recreated this level of awesomeness. Like I think the the second Boston album has some good shit on it, but then from that point on the band did music that was good but not great. And I don't think I've heard anything past Third Stage, which was their third album that came out in the 80s. So um but I think that that's the reason why is because I remember being so into this album and then hearing Don't Look Back and then hearing Third Stage and being like, "Oh, well they I mean, I love that they're still doing shit, but man, it's it is, the caliber of songwriting and and everything is just not there. But there was guess, a major major gap between "Don't Look Back" and Third Stage as well, wasn't there? It was like eight yeah. years. It was a long, yeah, it was a long time, and I think that was a it, it had to do with record label uh, disputes and shit like that. Oh, I believe that sucks. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. But they it, honestly like. Even if this is really the only Boston album that I love, it, just the fact that they made this one, I'm just like, this is it already a band that I look at and go, they're a fucking great band. Because if you can make one album that is this fucking good, then um, you don't need to make any more albums. <laughs> Everything else is just <laughs> gravy, you know, at that point. So, so there you go. That's my my uh, my number four, Boston. I'd say I could easily listen to to the first boston album and then the second one right after i could just do a double album with it and have a great time they are very similar in some respects except for i just think the songs aren't quite as memorable on don't look back yeah yeah that there there is a certain quality to the first boston album that's just so classic but mm-hmm. i i won't give too much away because i'm in a similar boat to you with one of oh them shit okay yep no, <laughs> let's, let's 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 move on now we're already on number three Right on. I actually, I actually made kind of a made kind of a goof with uh, my number four because my number four is actually my number three, but I swapped it at the last minute two oh, days okay. ago. Okay. Four. So twenty one twelve is number three now. Okay. All right. I like that. I'm okay with moving rush up as much as you want to. Hell yeah. So my number four, sorry, <laughs> is number Hotel three. California. Oh Eagles. yeah. Oh, Hotel California. All right. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why. Never mind. This is probably the most overplayed album from the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the battle of the overplayed albums. Dude, I I think these two would be the main main contenders. Well, I think Hotel California is well, no, maybe it's the Eagles greatest hits that's still like one of the top selling albums in the world. Yeah. God, man, like it's just such a it's such a great great largely chill album it's got a couple rockers on it too with life in the fast lane and and victim of love which Mm -hmm. rock but like the the title track is a classic new kid in town wasted time last resort it's a great album to listen to on vinyl especially Mm -hmm. if you just chill it (laughs) sorry i hit puberty (laughs) the other day (laughs) Whatever, whatever that was he was doing, you do it along with the Eagles album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's just a nice it's a nice album to chill to, with a couple pick me up hard rockers, interspersed between, just to it's just a nice album really, and I and yeah. I I like its relaxing quality. It's yeah. it's um, it's one I'll put on and I'll immediately be at peace. You know, uh, yeah. there's. There's certain albums that really do that for me, and, and Hotel California is one of them. I don't really, really have much to say outside outside of I just like chilling to it. But yeah, uh, if it's an album that feels good. Yeah, it's a feel it's a feel good album. Yeah, my uh, my oldest brother, who is like 17 years older than me, um, he had this on eight track, 
and we nice. would listen to it in his room sometimes. And I remember it was the first time that I heard uh, cussing or curse words in a song. Cause in life yeah. in the fast lane, he says, God damn. And I was all like, Oh my God. He said, <laughs> this dude said a bad word in this song. <laughs> and it was like, that was the beginning of me being like this. It's so awesome saying bad words. I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. How old were you when this happened? Uh, I was probably five or six, maybe. I had been that's, really young. That's awesome. Because for a while, <laughs> uh, up until, you know, around 1984, 85, e- and, and even then, too, I, uh, the, only the, mu- the only music I listened to was the stuff that was either on the radio or my older brothers were playing. And for the most part, my older brothers didn't listen to a lot of rock music. And if yeah. they did, it was stuff like Eagles and things like that. Um, so I didn't really know anything heavier was out there. So the fact that you hear, you know, this curse word on the yeah. song, I was like, this might as well be punk rock right here. <laughs> and it's funny, it's funny as well. It's, it's a relatively tame cuss, but still at, yeah. the, at the same time. <laughs> Cause he says like, haven't seen a goddamn thing or something like that. Is that yeah. the, the lyric? <laughs> and then just, just years later, you would hear just like, fuck. Piss shit. Like, you wet ass yeah. pussy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I still can't believe I blessed the world with that corn mashup, dude. Like that is um it's, it's pretty great. The the only the only <laughs> thing the only improvement I would have made, but I don't know how hard it is to do those mashups, is I wish that underneath all of the song you would have just heard boom, bah, bah, boom, bah, bah. like you know, if if you could have had that going underneath the entire thing. That would be cool. <laughs> that's but you know that's for another time. That's just a, that's just the that's the twelve inch remix. Criticism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't know, over on Eddie's channel, he did a great mashup of the song WAP uh, by who is it by? It's it's uh, Megan Car- the Stallion and Cardi, Cardi B. B right? Yeah, Cardi B and Megan the Stallion. Megan the Stallion from from where I live right now, Houston, Texas. Um, and then he mashed that up with uh, Freak on a Leash. Or the, the the breakdown riff from Freak yeah. on a Leash. And I was listening. Uh, I was listening sweet. to WAP, and and I just and I just heard it, and I thought that's the fucking Freak on a Leash riff. So I I just <laughs> that that's how my brain works. It'll be like, where have I heard this before? Ah, yeah, that's unexpected. And then I'll I'll I've got more as I call them cursed mashups in the Ooh. pipeline. In the pipeline, that they're, they're kind of. I call them cursed mashups because they're kind of the thing that should not be <laughs> yeah. to quote Metallica on that one. But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I th- I'm, you know what? I think they should be personally. Hell yeah. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so are you done with the Eagles here? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a nice album. All right. All right. A nice album. I, I, I can't uh, I can't argue with that. I, I'm not an Eagles fan, but but if I was going to describe their music, I would say it was nice. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, for my number three, I'm going to be going from one of the most overplayed albums, one of the most, uh, I don't know, like ever, to one of the most underrated albums ever. I, this is pro- like if I was going to make a list, maybe one day we'll do a top five underrated albums. This would be up there. Like I mean, this might even be number one. I don't fucking know. Oh wow! Um, but my uh, my number three is the self titled debut album from the band Stars. S T A R Z. I'm using Z because you know, for 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 the England. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stars with a Z. Uh, Stars. This was their debut album that came out in 1976, and it is fucking perfect. Like I don't. It, it's an album that I I the first time I heard it. I I heard it already knowing that it was a band that didn't do as well as everyone had hoped. Um, yeah. They only put out, I believe, four albums in the 70s, and then that was it. But they had a lot of hype behind them because they were uh, managed by the same manager as Kiss. And so I think because of that, people would say, oh, they're just a wannabe Kiss, but they're not. They didn't wear makeup, and they made better music than Kiss, especially <laughs> this album, which is like, take what would later be, I guess, described as power pop, but put metal-sounding riffs. And when I say metal, I mean 70s metal. I don't mean Slayer. But um, <laughs> it's just the overall performances of the band. I mean, they're way, they are way better musicians than Kiss ever were. 
and the the songs are so good, but they're so good because they each have these really catchy hooks, very well written songs with amazing vocals. The the singer is is just one of those voices I just I love hearing him sing. Uh, Michael E. Smith is his name, and then um, on top of that, all of the songs they have riffs in them, like mm. full on riffs, and not just that. They don't just stop with like what like if you just listen to like intro verse chorus and then decide all right I'm skipping to the next track you're probably gonna miss a badass riff that happens in the midsection or sometimes it's just a riff they throw in at the end for good measure because they had another one lying around and they and they have all these great like the the things that I love about bands because there there are some great rock bands who like eight let's say ACDC ACDC is a great band but they are. Four four time. There's no swinging to the left and the right. There there's no little weird accents here and there. It's all straightforward. Yeah. Bands like Stars will take that what's a basic rock song and they will add things that just make it go in all these different spikes that you don't expect it to go while still being poppy as fuck with the actual song. You could strip these songs down and just make soft pop songs probably for most of them, except for that the lyrics for the most part wouldn't go over very well with soft rock fans because yeah. you've, got, you've got everything ranging from uh, hypersexual. Like there's a line in one of the songs where they say, uh, when we come, it tastes just like a milkshake. Like that's uh, <laughs> one of the lyrics. Wow. And then later on, one of my favorite songs on the album is called Pull the Plug, and it's literally a song about assisted suicide, about your 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 loved one or your wife or girlfriend is on life support, and you're just like, you know, it, things aren't going well. I'm going to pull the plug and end it for you. And it's just like, there's so many things about this, this particular album, because I don't think they did, they, their other three albums are good in, in different ways, but this is the one where they nailed it, Every song's great. The energy is great. The performances are great. I don't understand why this isn't huge. Like, I don't... There are so many 70s bands that even... Like, so there's the ones that were big. And then there are smaller bands that, like, hipsters have taken on and been like, oh, this band's really cool now. And so when you want to go find a vinyl by them, you got to pay 80 or more dollars <laughs> to get it. Yeah. Stars is not one of those bands. Stars is still uncool. And maybe that's why I like them even more. But I just don't get why this particular album... It, I, I, I'm okay if, if people don't like the next three. But this particular album, I don't understand why it's not something that everybody, when they're talking about the 70s, talks about. I mean, some bands do. You've heard uh, Motley Crue. I mean, without this band, Motley Crue, Poison, Van Halen doesn't yeah. fucking exist. There are so many aspects from this particular album that you would start hearing from all of these other bands. And I love it. I never get tired of this album. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a good time. It's heavy. And, uh, I don't, it's, if, if, for, if, for those of you out there listening, if you don't know this album, please just, you know, just wait till this podcast is over and then, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> go, uh, listen to, uh, the first album from stars. Cause it is, it's, it's one of the best of the seventies in my opinion. Yeah, I was doing a little bit of a. Uh, I there's a, there's a channel I watch called uh, Sea of Tranquility. It's this guy called uh, Pete yeah. Pardo. Mm -hmm. He um, like he does a lot of stuff. He you know either talks to the camera or or occasionally um, has. Well, actually, more recently, he's had more people on talking with him and stuff. And mm -hmm. I found stars through him, and I've got all four of their albums lined up to listen to at actually pretty soon because i've been doing kind of a deep dive um of his channel because it's great if you want to get into like kind of the 70s stuff yeah um so any of i recommend that channel if you want to kind of do a 70s deep dive because he talks about a lot of bands that should have been way way more recognized like stars for example yeah. and um yeah, I, I'm probably going to do a Stars binge right after this episode. You, now I come you to should. Think of it. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the way their albums go, especially when you get to the second and third, because the second album is really good, but it, the production, it feels lighter, so it doesn't have the same punch that the first one does. Yeah. And then the third one, they get even more kind of poppy, uh, but they get a little bit more back on track with the fourth. But um, they're all good. Like, it's just 
some amazing songwriting. And I mean, I guess maybe, I don't know if they were overshadowed by, uh, by Kiss because of the management. I'm actually halfway through uh, reading a book that just came out that's called uh, They Just Seem a Little Weird. And ah. it's, it's basically an intertwining story about Kiss, Cheap Trick, Aerosmith, and Stars. Wow. And um, it, because they're all connected in several ways, either just touring together, similar management, they all existed in a similar time period. Um, and I'm halfway through the book, and it's one of the, the most enjoyable books I've ever read. Uh, but you get a lot of cool information about stars, but on top of that, um, just stuff that you didn't know about you know, the connections between those four bands. And so, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, maybe I'll get to the point where I where I learn a little more because there's not a lot of information about stars out there. Like either mm -hmm. their wiki is pretty small, and it's not like they have dedicated. At least I haven't found like a dedicated fan site with a long, lengthy bio. Um, but there, it's it's definitely one of those things where I just I feel for that band because they they should have been massive in my opinion. Yeah, I could I could definitely see that. I, by the looks of things, a, a while ago I I heard I heard a few stars songs and I've got them saved. I'll probably recognize them as soon as I hear them. But uh, I have quite a few saved on my uh, Spotify here as I'm flicking through it. For, uh, just, I'm telling you, just just hop into the Stars album, the first one, and it's just yeah. crank that shit up. It's just is good. Hell yeah, cool. So Moving I guess on. we're on number two. Uh huh. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I kind of fucked it with my twenty one twelve uh, jump up there. Of, That's uh, all right. So if, if you're all <laughs> taking notes at home, his number four was actually the Eagles Hotel California, and his number three was Rush twenty one twelve. Now we'll 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 get back on track. <laughs> okay. So for my number two, I'm I'm taking the rule book and I'm tearing it in half because I have awesome. a I have a joint joint number two. And and I feel oh. as though Well if, I, if, I, if you know what if you're if you're if you're doing it then I have a joint number two also. Oh. <laughs> so um, wait, number two yeah. and number one. Yeah. So well I actually, actually I have Oh, so are you are you saying that you have two albums in number two? I have two albums at number two, and here is get the here fuck out of here. <laughs> you're literally you're ruining the reputation of this podcast. <laughs> All right, I'll let I'll let you do it. My only defense is that it it doesn't happen often, so That's you true. know it's it, That's true. it's 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 very it's it, releasing two albums in one year is a rare thing as we as we further oh on. i see where you're going okay yeah. this is a, this is allowable so both 1976 kiss albums destroyer and rock and roll over yeah yeah and i feel like i did my boy rock and roll over dirty last last time because <laughs> i i put it at number 12 and i just i just love yeah. so many kiss albums it's hard for me to to give all of them the the well, the love they deserve. Yeah, but, but to be to be fair, it's it's different when you're listening to just just those albums with other albums from 1976. When you're listening to the whole Kiss disc discography, it's a lot harder yeah. to to figure that shit out. So I I feel for you. But yeah, it, it, in a shocking turn of events, you get a two for one deal this episode because yeah, Destroyer and Rock and Roll Over, same same year, but like they're different enough in feel as well. Mm -hmm. That I feel like, you know, it was well, it's, it's pretty clear one is a one is a response to the other. Um, you know, Destroyer was really overblown and and mm -hmm. cr crazy levels of production and and size, and then Rock and Roll Over returns to the kind of um, just good time rock and roll kind of thing. I mean, obviously they did that with Destroyer as well, but on a grand scale. Whereas this, this just, it's, it's just fun. Um, and I've just fallen completely in love with Kiss all over again. <laughs> you know, ever, ever since like the, the last three episodes we did, uh, you know, Kiss were on a roll in the mid 70s. And while they were separated, you know, episodically in our Kiss ranking, they both rule and there is no denying that. So, hell yeah. Destroyer and rock and roll over. 
Awesome. Like like I said before, when I talked about Destroyer, if you want to hear us go more in depth, go check out those uh, Kiss discography ranking episodes. Um, on top of on top of it just being you know cool to talk about Kiss, I think those those seem like some of the f- most fun episodes we did. Um, I yeah. feel like you know we both just really enjoyed ourselves, which is um, that's cool. But um, so yeah, so moving on. So what I what I was saying when you said you had a joint number two is I was referring to the fact that. Um, I, I want to put my number two and number one, like so close to each other that they're, <laughs> that their butts are touching. Like, I just want to, <laughs> just because I have it's really, too. <laughs> it's just, uh, it was, it was really hard to, uh, to, to figure out which one went where, but I made a decision in the end and I'm happy with my decision. But uh, my number two album from 1976 is the album Rocks by Aerosmith. I knew this would be here. I knew it, it would be. What a fucking amazing album. I, yeah. Aer- 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 Aerosmith is one of my favorite bands. But this album is it's so fucking good. And it's, and it's one of those albums that just went on to influence so many people. Like oh, you, like time. you name it. I, I've heard like now. Uh, there's the direct com- comparisons to bands like Guns N' Roses, but on top of that, for all you thrashers out there, like Metallica, they were big fans. Fucking Testament covered a song from this album on yep. their s- second album, and uh, nobody's fault, wasn't nobody's, it? Nobody's, yeah, yeah. Which is the heaviest song on the record, so it's like you know it makes sense. Yeah. But but rocks is, I think I don't know if it's my favorite. Aerosmith album, but I feel like it's the ultimate, like the quintessential. Like if somebody's really into the kind of music that Aerosmith would do and want to get into Aerosmith, like Toys in the Attic's great and all, but I feel like this one is way more solid and has way more attitude and a and a harder edge. So it's almost like the best, most sort of like raw representation of Aerosmith. And yeah. I mean, it starts with "Back in the Saddle." There, there's literally not a bad song on this record. I'm back, "Back in the Saddle," "Last Child," "Rats in the <laughs> Cellar," combination. All of these, they all have qu- fucking cool riffs in them. Mm. And, and and on this particular album, there was a lot more uh, input from Brad Whitford and uh, and Tom Hamilton uh, when it came to songwriting and stuff. And I think um, that's another thing I do like as much as I love Joe Perry, Joe Perry fucking rules, but Brad Whitford is a very underrated guitar player. Like that dude is fucking great. And the, the, the this album to me, the, the thing that I always love about this album, every time I listen to it and it is one that should be listened to from beginning to end. I don't, it's not a, like I, I like there are albums that like I do think that some songs are stronger than others and you can pick and choose and I'd be totally fine with that. But there are like the best albums are the ones where I'm like, no, sit your ass down, turn everything off, <laughs> grab the gatefold. Well, there's no gatefold in this, but, you know, read the lyrics or just just take it all in because uh, rocks to me is like the ultimate soundtrack to a rowdy night out with the boys. Yeah. Like, the way the album flows, because back in the saddle just sounds like, you know, the, the song you play when you're getting ready to, to go out and meet the boys. You're just like, because that is the ultimate pump up kind of song. Oh, yeah. And then there's these, these different levels of it just feels like you're going out with with the boys and you're getting into some trouble. And um, at some point, you know, s- somebody drinks a little bit too much or has too many shots and gets a little bit sick. And then at some point, your crew meets up with another crew and you have a fight with each other. And you don't even know <laughs> how the fight started, but you just know that there's all this aggression going on. And then, and, you know, once you get to the to the end of the, the album, once you get to home tonight, it's finally like the point where you're just like calling your girlfriend like, babes, I, I've had a rough night. I'm coming home. I, I, you know, this, this night's over. And it just feels like the... It just almost like a concept album without actually having any kind of concept except for just being a rambunctious, rowdy rock and roll band. Oh, but yeah. it is, it's got so many fucking good songs. Like it's no, I don't even know what my favorite song would be. Probably Sick as a Dog. But it's probably because I just like the riff in Sick as a Dog a lot. It's just, you know, it's, I, can't, I can't do guitar riffs very well with my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but yeah, nobody's fault was covered by Testament, and it's nobody's fault is the song that I almost feel like that particular song, the verse, riff, and vocal 
has been ripped off by about 500 bands since then. Yeah. <laughs> because just the riff itself, and then his, like it's just, it literally yeah. sounds like 500 other songs that would come after Aerosmith. It definitely um, sounds like one of the meaner glam bands with like yeah. a, a more stripped back production. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, Aerosmith's another band that once we get to ranking them, I'm just going to have a blast because there is, and I'm not even understating this, folks, there is no bad Aerosmith album. I don't care what era you're talking about. Um, just like Kiss, you could probably compare them, especially starting with Permanent Vacation, kind of a different band, but they still sound similar enough to their 70s stuff that it's not that big of a difference. But um, there is a difference. They've become a lot more, I don't know, mainstream poppy with their rock music, but they're still so much attitude, even with the last album they put out, which is like, was it yeah. fucking, has it been 10 years now, I think, since they put out an album? I don't think they'll put out another one, but, you know, whatever. I, it's, it is what it is. It's kind of like, how would you compare it to, like, 70s Kiss versus 80s Kiss? Because that's, like, two different bands, whereas Aerosmith I, I, no, have Aerosmith, more of a core sound. Yeah, yeah they, they never strayed too far from being blues-rooted rock and roll music. Um, I just mm. think that once you got to permanent vacation and they started collaborating with songwriters a little more and they stretched out themselves because there are some amazing tracks that are really well-known Aerosmith tracks that are not co-written by anybody. They're Steven Tyler, Joe Perry originals or whoever, you know, yeah. um, like fucking Janie's got a gun. We talked about that on the 1989. Uh, that was in my top five of 89. Um, that song's amazing. And that is not as a full on Aerosmith original song. And it is so well-written, but you know, if you go back to rocks, they were doing shit on their own back then, drug addled as fuck. <laughs> they just, <laughs> you know, still managing to put out these amazing records. And uh, and honestly, they they end up following it up with an album that I think is also awesome, which is Draw the Line. Which is the, that's a weird album. When, when we talk about seventy seven, we'll talk about Draw the Line. But that is one of those albums that people that just now discovered Aerosmith, they'll be like, you could tell the band was falling apart when they made that album. I'm like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> you read that in an article. Shut the hell up. But anyway, we're talking about Rocks because Rocks is amazing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so close to my number one with how much I love it. That, um, but, I, but I had to put it here at number two. So there you go. I think it's cool as well. Like you have to, when you refer to it as Aerosmith Rocks, they're just saying we fucking rock. Yeah, like, I know. I know there's. I know there's. You know, diamonds on the front, and it's 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 a fun play on words, but it's true. You know, mm, it rocks. They, they absolutely did do and did. <laughs> right on. So uh, I think we've got a, a relatively similar list um, because our so this is my number one now, isn't it? Yep, number one. Yeah, number one. My number one is Boston. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. This is classic 70s hard rock at its fucking finest, dude. Like, this album is just one excellent track after another. <laughs> yeah. You know, also, another San Andreas plug, by the way, because Smokin' is on the KDSD radio. Awesome. And there we go. We go. Our paychecks will be coming in next week for those one, plugs. One time, one time that sticks out in my mind as like a relatively new kid to, to rock. It couldn't have been more than like 11 or 12. I was playing the game and I hopped in a fighter jet because I managed to breach the wall in like the military base in the desert. And I, I, I was running towards it and I got in the fighter jet, and as soon as I turned the fighter jet on, what do I hear? And it took off. It was like something out of fucking Top Gun, and then nice. I was just laying waste to all the enemy fighters. Speaking, of, speaking of that, when the fuck is Top Gun 2 coming out? Like, I've been waiting for that shit for... They, I saw the trailer like two years yeah. ago. Come on, Tom Cruise. Just put that shit out on Netflix. Top Gun Maverick. 2021 film so I, th I think it's slated to be this year i'm ready yeah. it's probably gonna be bad but i don't care <laughs> <laughs> i'm just gonna, gonna enjoy it because like because well, you go back and watch top gun it's a pretty shitty movie it's just a very well done shitty movie <laughs> <laughs> but now, i love honestly it. i if 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 Crazy Lex's Silent Thunder is not in the fucking soundtrack i'm boycotting <laughs> the movie because it's quite clear that they they 
designed that whole song around Top Gun 2. Because there's no way it's on the soundtrack. It's oh, it would be so fucking cool though if it was like such a love letter. But oh. I really, if they want to really make me happy, then somewhere in there, Kenny Loggins has to come back and do a brand new song for the soundtrack. <laughs> He's one of the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, okay, just put him in the fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> or he's like the air, air traffic controller in the tower. That'd be so cool. That's fine. <laughs> I just think a new a new original song from Kenny Loggins for the Top Gun Maverick movie. Anyway, this Ca- is a- Captain Loggins would be so fucking good. One of, our- <laughs> <laughs> One of our famous tangents here, but I'm but I just had to. You said Top Gun, and my brain went boop. Uh, when's Top Gun Maverick coming out? <laughs> Oh man, like it just just hopping back to Boston though, like more than a feeling, peace of mind, foreplay, long mm. time, smoking. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like my god, the quality, the quantity of quality here is fucking second to none. Yeah. Uh, do do you think that um the Boston album is the the most that that hand claps have ever been recorded for an album <laughs> because it seems like almost like so many yeah. songs have parts with hand claps. And I'm just like, that's gotta be some kind of record. I've, I've not really given that any thought. I Maybe some kind of glam to... rock band is probably the winner with that, but who knows? Oh man, I'm going to have to look this up now. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do one of those like stupidly long challenge videos on YouTube. I'm just going to post like a full 40 something minute video of me just clapping along to all the claps and counting them to, it's, it's probably <laughs> the just album. just how i remember it because you're going to go back to it and find out it's only two tracks that have claps in it but it just <laughs> seems like they're very prominent parts of songs <laughs> but the two tracks that do have it have like 300 each <laughs> <laughs> i mean long time the fucking chorus it drops out and it's just an acoustic guitar and hand claps so oh man like just thinking about this album though is is it's one of those where I pick it up and I know exactly what I'm in for, but it's going to feel just as good as the first time. Like certain albums, I'm like, like for me, a big one for me is Master of Puppets. I have heard it so many times that I rarely listen to it anymore because I know exactly what is going to happen. Mm. But when I do, I fucking love it. But this album to me is and and that's one of my favorite albums this album Mm. to me though is just one of those if you're in the if you're in the mood for 70s hard rock this is going to scratch every itch that you are looking to satisfy like it's so phenomenal and huge sounding and Mm -hmm. the 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 most insane part like you mentioned previously is i didn't know the basement thing up until recently Mm mm-hmm I thought that this was a big budget move from a band just big dicking it into the music industry. <laughs> you know, they they were like, hey, we've got eight songs and we know they're fucking classics. Uh, can we use your studio for like a week? And then come to find, it was just Tom Schultz in his basement. How cool is this? Like, I, re- I mean, honestly, the story behind the album, I, I would, if in a perfect world, we would have a full link feature film just about yeah. the making of the, not only the beginning of Boston, but the making of this album and everything that went they went yeah. through. Just because they just, you know, I, I don't think that they, they, you know, especially Tom Schultz, like they just wanted to make the best thing they could make. They, I, He wasn't that interested in just all of a sudden becoming a star. And so I think that's where the stress came from for him was he was like, I don't want to just yeah. make another schmaltzy 70s rock thing. You know, and so I think that that's it's it's fascinating to me. It's I there's so many albums, especially from around the 70s, that I just the stories of them are so good that, that, you know, there should at least be, you know, a book just written about that or a movie. Come on, man. If they could could, could make a movie about Eminem just doing rap battles for an hour and a half, they could do, (laughs) (laughs) they could do, not not to, you know, I mean, I love that movie, by the way, but not to, you know, they could, they could easily make one about the ins and outs of dealing with a, with a, a the record company and the record industry when you're a new band trying to make something special. 
especially when you're <laughs> doing it. Because I think it, I think that even when at the end of the day, when they were done recording the album, they had to rent like a van to come, and then they had to like string a wire from the basement studio in order to transfer the shit to tapes. So the record company had no idea <laughs> that the shit <laughs> was being recorded in a basement. So I mean. That's just wow. fucking. That's fucking great. Great album with a great story behind it. I, it it it, w- it was a mind blower the first time, and it's a mind blower to this day. Yep. If you um, want, if you want to get blown, listen to Boston. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then that uh, if 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 you've really been paying attention, then you already know what my number one is because I haven't talked about it yet. Um, but yeah. it is very close to my number two. It's really rough, but at the end. I had to go with 2112 by Rush as my number one album of 1976. I don't think I'm going to get a lot of argument from a lot of people out there. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else we could say about this album. This album is amazing. The, the number one thing that I love about this album is it is the ultimate band taking a chance and saying, fuck it, we don't care, we're going to make the album we want to make. Because yeah. prior to this with Caress of Steel... Album didn't do well. Tours weren't doing well. Record company didn't like it. Um, the band wasn't, you know, selling the records they should have been selling. And they had a choice. They, 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 the, the record company wanted them to make stuff that was more in line with their early shit, which was more of the Zeppelin-y, Zeppelin-y, Zeppelin-y that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, influenced kind of stuff. And um, they decided not to do that and to go even more proggy with uh, this particular album. And it's just, and the fact that it paid off is just, it's, it's, it's so great. And I, I love that sort of shit because that's how I, I mean, we talk about band discographies all the time and the best albums to talk about are the ones where the bands take a chance and it doesn't, it's not always going to pay off because in hindsight, you look at 2112 and you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they decided to make a proggy album and it was great. But so many bands over the years, have done the very same thing where they decided to go with their with their hearts and what they wanted to make and then it just falls flat and nobody gives a shit and the band dissolves and and so that's why I I'm always really I always get very annoyed by people talking about bands selling out when they make yeah. an album that sounds different because I'm just like there's no there's no guarantee that any mm. album is going to do well. I don't care if cuz I mean if that were the case then everyone would just make stuff that sounded like, you know, trap music or, or, or mo- the yeah. modern hip hop sound. Everyone would just do that. But that's not the case. You can't, you know, like, like the next Judas Priest album can't sound like trap music because nobody's <laughs> going to fucking want to listen to it. Well, you know, maybe it will sell a lot of copies. I don't fucking know. But I'm just saying like, you can't, you can't just do the cool thing and expect it to, to go well. Cause it doesn't actually work that way. Or, and in the case of 2112, the opposite, where they, at this point, proggy music wasn't super cool. It was, you know, a small niche group of people that were really into that kind of thing. And they did this, and it fucking blew up. Um, now, speaking of the album itself, the one, I, so I love this album, but the thing, so here's my, I'm going to give my interpretation of this album, because if you go online, sure, you can read a story telling you what it's about. And for the most part, if you just listen to it, most of that story is in the the lyrics so you can yeah. you can gather it because the story is obviously you know we're on a planet in the future uh where there literally is no entertainment like that's guess not a thing everyone just lives and works and reads and that's kind of their life and this one guy randomly in a cave one day finds this thing he doesn't know what it is it's a guitar and you even hear him tuning up the guitar, like in the fucking song. Like, brrr, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's got that. Um, and then, of course, he takes it to the big, you know, priests, the the the, the big wigs of the planet, and says, look, look, "Look at this motherfucking! Look what I found!" And they're like, "Fuck that!" And they destroy it. And then he goes, he fucks off to back to his cave, and he's really sad, and he goes to sleep, and he has a dream that might be a dream, who knows where he, he, he's given this information that there are these other planets out there where music just flows free, freely and everyone is happy and they express themselves. And he wakes up and he's like, God damn it, these places exist and I am not going to ever be able to live there. I'm going to kill myself. And so he, he kills himself. And that's where the story ends on the actual fucking album. 
Now, if you go and read it, it's all like, well, now all of a sudden there's a battle between, you know, different forces. I don't know exactly how, what, the, what the terms they use, but none of that's in the album. It's just a real sort of upbeat, climactic ending. And there's no, there's no more lyrics. So really, like, except for the very, the very end of it, you know, when you hear the voice say, you know, attention, all planets of the Solar Federation. We have assumed control. Like, that's the last thing you hear. So I'm saying all of this because I'm getting to to my interpretation. Because I feel like, sure, a story was written by Neil Peart, and he knows what happened. But for the listener, if I bought this album in 1976, I don't know that story. There's only a little paragraph on the back of the album that says anything about what's going on. So my interpretation has always been that um, home dude kills himself and then because you don't know what's going on in the end of the album i've always felt like that is the the priests and anyone else on other planets that had now gotten word that this motherfucker found this guitar every now they're doing recon so i i imagine that they are all going searching everywhere they can to find any remnants of this old world and fucking destroying everything and that's why at the end they're like you know, we have now we have we have uh, assumed control again because we you know yeah. we now have to no longer worry about these people finding these musical instruments. And so I've always thought that that was kind of what it was about. I didn't know it was a battle where eventually the planet wins anyway, and I, I, or whatever the Solar Federation or whoever the fuck it is. I'm not that big of a nerd, so I don't <laughs> I don't have yeah. a, I don't know all the names and shit. But on top of that. On top of that story, it's like a perfect analogy of what was going on with Rush. Because Rush is all like coming to their record label being like, hey, we've made this music. And they're like, we don't like it. And so, you know, they, it's basically like the, the, you're, you're, it's like the, it's the ultimate, like when you're young and into rock and roll for some of us, I I mean, I, you see, you seem like you have nicer parents than a lot of us did. Oh yeah. But a lot of us grew up where, you would be very passionate about rock and roll or metal and your your parents and other adults would be like, that's a waste of time. Yeah. They just shit on you for it. Yeah. And 2112 yeah. is the ultimate thing of like, Oh, this is the exact same thing where this dude finds this music and the, the hires up are like, fuck that. You don't need yeah. that in your life. And so it's like the, it's so many levels of awesome. Um, when it comes to the story of, of 2112. So then you flip over to the B side which to me is, you could look at it and go, it's not related at all. Um, but to me, it is a little bit related because obviously you've got Passage to Bangkok, which is literally about going around and finding the best weed you could find so you can get high. And then <laughs> the Twilight Zone to me. So here's, so here's how I break down side two. So side two, side one is the story of, of you know, 2112. Side two is the story of the band deciding to make 2112. So here they are, passage to Bangkok. They're like, we're just going around trying to find some good weed. This is some good weed. Let's smoke it. Then all of a sudden, you enter the twilight zone. You're high as fuck, man. And they're just like, (laughs) man, this is some fucking amazing weed. And then they get into the song Lessons. And the Lessons is like, like in the lyrics, it's all like, you know, something about, you know, you didn't listen. You didn't listen again. Like that's in there. And so it's almost like they're high and they're having this discussion of like, man, we try to do the best that we can do for, you know, for the record label and for our fans. And like, nobody gives a shit. Like, what do we do? And then the song Tears comes around and that's a little more of a somber affair. And Tears is the point where the band is like, you know, guys, if we make this choice, it could be the end of our careers. Everything could end here. So we have to realize that we may just have to return home and go back to our regular jobs. This may be it. And in the end, with something for nothing, they decide to fucking make the album. You can't have something for nothing. You can't have freedom for free. And once 2112 came out and they, 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 it was a big hit, guess what the band had for the rest of their career? Fucking freedom. So it's like, oh, yeah. it's literally like these two different things and they're related to each other because of that. Now, I mean, I may be a complete nerd and reading too much into it, but I've always felt like it just feels like that. It feels like side A is the story. Side B is the story of the album happening 
just not told specifically. Like he doesn't actually say, and then we yeah. decided to rock and roll. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't happen that way. But it's just, just the fact that I could talk this much about this album is like so fucking great. We're not even talking about the music on it. And the music on it is amazing. Everything from the most metal sounding riffs all the way down to the real smooth and soft acoustic parts that are real beautiful it's just got everything on it. It just goes to every level that Rush can go to. Um, I mean, at, at this point in their career, like I really do think that they topped this album for sure. But it's just one of those albums that I never get tired of listening to it because I get things that, as well as I know the album, I get something out of it every time, like an emotion out of the the music and and everything that it just doesn't go away. It feels like a fresh, yeah. important album every time I listen to it. And I know that was a really long winded thing, but it's it really is. And you know, it's one of those things where I, it is a concept album, but really only one half of it is like the actual story. But just the way that everything goes together for me, and the fact that it was such a fuck you to the music business, like they were like, we're going to do whatever the fuck we want. And then on top of that, the fact that it was successful, it just makes it one of the best stories and albums of the seventies and, yeah. and my favorite album of 1976. There you go. <laughs> I want to touch on, I want to touch on the uh, thing about like, you know, parents versus rock and roll and things, things yeah. like that. I was always brought up around all sorts of music. I was never told you can't listen to that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe some Eminem songs that were particularly, nasty for for an 11 year old kid to be listening to you but you know it's, yeah. it's you know aside from that you know i was always encouraged to just listen to whatever the fuck i wanted in my house but mm -hmm. the funny th the funny thing is is i guess this is like a a generational thing um as well because you know obviously back back when you were a kid there was the pmrc there was all that kind of yeah. stuff um for me growing up i wasn't shunned by my parents for liking rock and metal but more my peers you know everybody else yeah, was i can see that like because for for me liking the kind of metal i do and the kind of rock i do specifically i didn't fit with like the emo core kids at mm -hmm. my school and I didn't really fit with the basic just pop kids either. So my friend group was the most misfit fucking bunch of people you yeah. could ever see. And some of them were on board with the rock stuff and some of them didn't have any interest in music full stop. Yeah. But it's just, it's my growing up as a metalhead was an interesting one for me because I didn't have any flack at home, but the moment I left my house, it was like, you're a shitty person for liking this music. I'd be like, whoa, that's well, a not only that. Yeah. Like <laughs> not only that, the, the perception of that music. And, and I, there's a couple things that you can blame. I obviously in the eighties, things did get overblown, but, um, it happened for me too. When I, when I was in high school, like you got to a certain point in the nineties where if you had long hair, you were Beavis and Butthead. Like yeah. you, you were an idiot. You were, you were a stoner moron. You couldn't possibly. I, it's I ironic because they had short hair in the show as well. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just remember that that was the thing where all of a sudden metal, especially, and a lot of like, if you're get, talking about the eighties rock music, yeah, that stuff became the butt of a joke. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't cool at all. So it's almost like you, like you, like were even more passionate about it because you had to make it through that thing. Because I at least was into it when it was really popular. Like I was really, and I got into rock and metal when it was at its peak. Yeah. And um, but you didn't have that. Like you had the, the biggest thing you had going when you were like a little little kid was I don't know like Lincoln Park and shit like that, that. That was probably still popular when you were starting to discover things. See, that that's the thing. My my experience was like up and up and until the I would say roundabout I mean this happens with every decade. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of bleed from the previous one yeah. into the first couple years of it. 
So for the first two years of being a metalhead, it felt a lot like the 2000s stuff, really. New metal was still common among mm. those sorts. The, the um, I call them the core kids because if it didn't have core in it, it wasn't real music. They they legit <laughs> only they only listened to music for the breakdowns. And I briefly I had a breakdown phase when I was about fourteen because I was like, I want to see how fucking slow someone can play power chords. And then eventually mm-hmm. got totally burnt out on it because I was like, because then you're just playing doom metal at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, like that's the thing. I I went from dun 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 dun, dun to dun dun. Dun, dun, all the way down to <laughs> dun, 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 dun. and and eventually it got to the point where there's actually a really funny piss take joke video called like slowest breakdown ever and it's just these kids in a in a garage and every time the clock strikes they hit a fucking power cord because they're going for like the, they're literally doing one bpm so they just look at a yeah. clock and go, Dum. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's a weird one. My <laughs> journey with my journey with guitar based music has been a strange one because I came of age in an era where, you know, of course guitars are still around, but their prominence in a lot of popular music. It, in the rock realm is has kind of waned a bit like it's it's not at the forefront and i think there was a big time i'd say around 2013 when this really took off is this rock doesn't need guitars to be rock you know that's a that's an outdated closed-minded mindset if you use a guitar you're stuck in the past dude and it's like uh hold on wait this is a defining characteristic of rock and roll from day one yeah you know and and i can understand you know i don't know how it is in the u.s but i feel like in britain at least there is a disproportionate amount of attention and i'm not taking anything away from people who enjoy it but mtv rocks over here for example one of the channels that at least did proclaim to play rock music and it was one of the mm-hmm. actual mtv music channels in over here i'm sure they've got it over there too but i don't i they, don't think they have a music channel over here at least i don't know about it yeah because like i would watch it and i would turn it on i'd be like okay there's nothing on kerrang and there's nothing on scuzz scuzz was the best one because that had the most variety but even that became a bit samey after a while because kerrang and scuzz after a while all they did was play new metal and pop punk 24 yeah. 7 which you know, is great, but have a block for it. Play a bunch of other stuff, mm-hmm. but which is what they used to do. MTV Rocks, on the other hand, had like really heavy metal logos and stuff, and it would be like then they would play Mumford and Sons for an hour, <laughs> and it's it, it did make me like it. It left me concerned after a while because I would flick through like the listings of it, and I'd be like. Okay, indie pop, indie folk hour, indie this. And uh, this is where I get to my saturation of indie kind of thing. I don't know how big it is over there, but in Britain, you can't fucking escape it. And I'm not saying it's a bad genre. I'm just saying a disproportionate amount of love is given to this one subsect of rock. Yeah, And it's big over here because indie is big in britain it just does well but it's just kind of it it left me feeling very alienated because you know i would have to search and search and search for fucking power chords on their programming blocks because it would just it would just be indie pop or folk (laughs) and and yeah over over here it almost seems like if you're actually talking about popular music rock is nowhere near the popular music like the stuff that even is big you're you're still talking about stuff like the Foo Fighters yeah that's but even that you know even if the Foo Fighters bring out an album and let's say that it it's successful and it gets in the top five 
by yeah. the following week, it is forced out by five more hip hop artists, which I have no problem with that because I like hip hop. I don't really like a lot of modern hip hop, but it, it, you, but you, the, the indie thing did happen over here too. Like there was a thing probably around 2010 or around that time where everything was the yeah. like foster the people and yeah. Kings of Leon and all Arctic of these things monkeys. that Arctic monkeys. I, I actually kind of dig that first Arctic monkeys record, but, um, but it was all these different forms of, of, of that, which it got kind of boring because, you know, some of it was good. Most of it I didn't like, but you know, there were shining stars here and there, but now that stuff doesn't seem like it's popular. Like, if like that was considered alternative on the alternative stations, you would hear that's Mumford it, that's and Sons. It. You would hear Mumford and Sons. Now alternative is like Billie Eilish, which is fine because you know I I like her. My daughter's really into her, so that I'm kind of vicariously living through her. Like I see how much she likes her, and I'm just like I, I dig it too. But I'm a it's big not- Billie Eilish fan because I I think she what she's doing is at least different, you know. Sure, and it's not, and it's but it's not rock music. So if you're yeah. a person that lo- loves rock music that we do, it's not there. The thing. So here's 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 my hope. So if if the if the trend if the trends work like a pendulum, where yeah. everything swings this way and then it swings back this way, in the late. You know, in the 90s, it's, it was all the way over here with rock music to where it got oversaturated and stupid and yeah. and it wasn't adventurous and fun anymore. And then it started to swing back. Now I think we're all the way over here. We got all the way over here where people were just like, fuck rock and roll for the most part. And then the people that are putting out rock music, they're either they either seem like they're doing it tongue in cheek or or it's like uh, what's that group? Greta Van Fleet. Who, yeah. who apparently, from what I see, are very talented dudes. They just need to find their original voice, and then I think they'll fucking nail it. They'll they'll be because they're but they're kids now. I think that I think that you're going to see a progression with those dudes where all of a sudden they're going to come up with their sound, and everyone's just going to be you know in the future you're just going to be like remember when they did that Zeppelin type stuff? Yeah, I think that's yeah. going to happen with them. But so the pendulum's coming back, and on top of that, you're starting to see hip hop artists incorporating emo and punk in yeah. their music. And then you have artists like I know I know it's it's a it's divisive with what he does and I'm not a big fan but Machine Gun Kelly is a guy that yeah. went from doing hip hop to doing pop punk. And so I think yeah. that's that's where it's going to start going back. It's not going to immediately get back to the shit that you and I are going to love, but I do think that we're moving in that direction, and it may be slow to the point where I'm going to yeah. be dead before it all fucking comes back. But <laughs> I feel like guitars are starting to come back in. And yeah. honestly, like I I just I would love things to go back to. I know that it's, you know, it maybe I'm looking at things through rose-colored glasses, but in the late eighties and the early nineties, I watched MTV all the time. I don't care if they were playing Bon Jovi or Nirvana or in Vogue or Dr. Yeah. Dre or Mariah Carey or whoever the fuck it was. I thought it was all really good music. Yeah. And, and sure I I've leaned towards the rock and metal and with, and the hip hop for the most part over the years, but Something about the fact that there was all this great music and me as a young person, I just took it all in. And so that's where I would like to get again. And I know that as an old person, I'm never going to be satisfied, I don't think. But I would <laughs> like for young people getting into music to have that world where it's just like, I don't know, where everything is just like, there's just good quality music coming from these different areas. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one particular thing. Now, I, now, the more that I'm getting older and the more that I'm listening to other people's recounts of growing up in the 80s, I think that I was, I was a little bit unique because I, I, there were clicks. And apparently, even back then, there were metal hipsters that were like, you can't listen to anything else but oh, Judas, sure. <laughs> Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. But I didn't grow up like that. Like yeah. I, and, it, and it had nothing to do with my upbringing. It just had to do with the music that was coming out and that was popular was music where all of it had something that connected with me. And so I'm hoping that's where we're going. It's, it may be wishful thinking, but you know, maybe by the time you have kids who know, who knows when that <laughs> will be maybe 10 years down the line, maybe less, 
but maybe once you have a kid and that kid becomes, you know, 10 years old, maybe the music will have moved back to where we have this, this just a fucking large amount of great music. And I guess the seventies were that way too, since we're talking about 1976, there was a lot of great music that was popular. It wasn't just rock. Like it was yeah. all sorts of shit. And I can listen to any of that stuff. Like I love all the funk stuff from back in the seventies and some of the soul. And, and then obviously you didn't have the hip hop yet. It was really, it was cause they took a lot of the funk records and that was, that led to hip hop. But it was, I'm, I think I, I'm hoping that we will get back to that where we just have yeah. the music that's popular is at least enjoyable in some respect. Cause there's so much shit that is popular now that I try so hard to find the positive end and I go, yeah, I guess they're, they're singing in key, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or the, but even, even like the fucking rapping, like hip hop, like the, the, all of a sudden the, the big thing is like, you don't rap on the beat anymore. Like there's a beat yeah. going, but you're doing something that's totally not even on it. And I'm just like, okay, I'm so, that's why once again, we're coming back around to why I called my channel and podcast old head because yeah. <laughs> I am that dude that goes, back in my day, shit was better. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so I do, I, I, I like that we've made it to this conversation because I feel like it was a conversation that was a long time coming. Yeah. But, um, but 1976, you know, so 1976, much. 1976, man. Awesome. So, the question is when it comes to years, where do we go from here? Like, obviously, we'll do, we'll do some more bands and other stuff. But we've been in the 90s a couple times, the 80s a couple times, and now in the 70s twice? I think, no, this is our first 70s one. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Because right. uh, uh, I'm thinking here, I'm thinking here. We've done three 80s ones now. We've done mm -hmm. 80, 82, 86, and 89. Mm -hmm. We've done two 90s ones. 91, 91 and 99. Should we split that down kind of the middle and do another 90s one? I think we should. What do you guys think out there? Also, also, I want to give a big shout out to all the peanut butter platypuses out there. That um, it's become a thing now. Yeah. That, that you just say peanut butter platypus. Uh, it, actually, it should be peanut butter platy pie. Peanut but, butter platy pie. But That's you know our what? Fan base. But platypuses is much more fun to say. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> so, um, so I just want to give a shout out. I keep saying that I'm going to go and find the names and read them out, and I'm sorry that I'm so lazy that I didn't do it, but. You know who you are. If you if, if if you last this long and you you know peanut butter platypus is what you say, and um, we know that you're you're one of us. One of us. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but um, praise be unto the peanut butter platypus. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I don't I don't know what else to say. 1976 was cool. We'll get to back to another year. We'll do another band. Um, we're just going to keep this shit moving because it is is a blast doing Hell this yeah. shit. Um, so do you have anything else to add before we wrap this one up? Oof. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this next 90s one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give the year away, but I'm, I'm thinking mid. I'm thinking mid. Okay. Mid 90s. Because we've it done... Would, it, would, it would make sense. We went way, way to 99, so... Yeah. And we did 91 last time. I want I want some good early '90s ones to look forward to in the future. So speaking of 1991, we have so many killer albums that are turning 30 years old this year. Yeah, like, it's so it's many nuts. Yeah, it, 90 the early '90s are 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 becoming well are now 30 years ago. You know, I, I actually yeah. I scared the shit out of my mom because I went up to her and I said, "Hey, do you want to be scared?" She was like, "Not really, but shoot." And I said. The Fresh Prince of Bel Air has been around for thirty years, and she was like, <laughs> "No." <laughs> but yeah. Oh man, that's my. That's like one of my favorite shows. Yeah, I. I it's like we're twins, dude. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was. I was really into G DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. So when I saw they gave him a show, I'm all like, "Yep, it's about time." <laughs> Anyway, so that's that's it for this episode of Cranked and Ranked for 1976. Um, as usual, uh, put your top five from 1976 down below because um, it's I, I like it. You know, I like the I like seeing everybody's favorite bands, favorite albums 
um, just because it's it's interesting because there's always some overlap with certain groups and certain albums, but there's always that one or two that you're just like, yeah. oh, that's interesting. And everyone's got their own musical story. And this just happens to be our musical story on this particular podcast. But um, so, yeah, that's all we got for this edition of Cranked and Ranked. Thank you very much for listening. We will see you guys again next time. Eddie, take us out. Later, dude.